Hello, you folk. Orc here. Do you ever feel like you're stuck at level one? Yeah, man, I'm always level one. Do you ever think to yourself, Orc, I need an upgrade in my life? I need an upgrade in my life. Then what you need is the Orc Life Upgrade. I used to be a level one kind of guy. I find myself in unclean situations and no one took me seriously in life. There were times when I couldn't make ends meet. I couldn't get any respect. Life at level one is difficult. You're forced to do things to survive that you ordinarily wouldn't even imagine doing. But there I was, living in the deep, deep realm of level one. Consuming garbage, living outdoors, using people's lawns as toilets, and when I did have a place to stay, I was drinking every day, all day. Level one is no place for a man to be, no place for an orc to be. That's why there's the orc life upgrade. It can take you from level one orc, like I used to be, to something far more spectacular, far more deserving of respect and admiration. We here at the Thume Mastery Orc Life Upgrade Organization are proud to present a level 3 orc. This is an orc who knows the town, who knows his business, is respected by his peers, and is constantly making the kinds of connections that take him to the upper levels of every aspect of his life. When he sends text messages out, people respond. He's the kind of guy who people respond to with admiration. When he's in downtown Denver, going through revolving doors, he's not thinking to himself, I used to sleep in these sorts of things. He's thinking to himself, I'm going to go meet a nice orc woman, because I'm at level three. I'm not just giving creatures minus one, minus one. I'm not giving creatures minus two, minus two. I'm giving the whole board minus two, minus two. And I'm filling a lane with three, three spirit creatures. At level three... The world is here for you to consume, just like the fine dining that Orc finds himself at on a regular basis with his lovely Orc waifu, Sandrork. Thanks, Orc Life Upgrade! All right, I think it's time we get this started. Hello, hello. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going well. We got three people on the screen for the first time ever. We do. This is very exciting. I, I Charm and I were uh, asking ourselves, like, let's say the podcast doesn't get canceled after one episode. Who's the, per the list of people, the dream people we want on? We went straight to the top. <laughs> it's a level zero orc. <laughs> chosen poorly. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think we chose pretty wisely. We got special guest Pete Hines from Bethesda here today, uh, oh, DC Deacon Online. How you doing tonight? <laughs> what did I say about the dog barking? <laughs> uh, did somebody clock me? Was it a minute? Uh, <laughs> a minute yeah. Before those damn dogs started barking. They uh, beat, that's uh, awesome. They beat Sorry, Justin's that's cat. That's gonna happen all night long, guys. Get used to it. Yeah, that is great. Oh, they beat um, Justin's cat. That's funny. Yeah. That's a good way to set things off, though, here, because uh, that's kind of how the show goes, so we just kind of roll with it. <laughs> so, Pete, how's your night going? Sorry, I was muting to avoid dog barks. So far, so good. Other than my basketball, uh, my university team sucks and lost to Georgia Southern, and... But whatever. I get to hang out with you two and talk legends and <laughs> things in general, and it can't be all that bad. And I 7 0 my uh, my uh, arena run on, on stream today, so I think that's the first time I've done that. Very nice, very nice. Not too shabby. No, no lightning bolts to the face tonight. <laughs> Did not lightning bolt myself in the face at all. Not once. <laughs> I've been there, man. Especially on my cell phone. I got these big orc fingers, and that's what happens. Yep. 
I like don't even play intelligence when I'm on the phone just to avoid it. <laughs> like it's just it's just warrior aggro when I'm on the mobile. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. How many savage ogres can I pick up today? How many werewolves? That's true. Uh, you know, so one of the things we kind of wanted to do is get let people get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, your, your college team lost. Uh, where'd you go to school, man? Uh, I went to Wake Forest University in North Carolina, um, better known as the Demon Deacons, hence my DC Deacon handle. Right on, right on. Um, is that where you're from, North Carolina? Uh, sort of. That's where I call home. I'm kind of from all over. I was actually born in... Uh, Puerto Rico and my dad was stationed there in the Coast Guard and then uh, we hopped around a lot so we lived in like Wisconsin and Mexico City and Cincinnati but sort of from like I don't know age 11 or 12 on we lived in North Carolina so I, I consider uh, Charlotte North Carolina is where my folks still are so that, that that was kind of my home. I can relate to that my my dad was in the, the Marine Corps we moved around a lot Pendleton and uh Oceanside, California, to mm -hmm. Kansas City, all over the place. Yep. <clears throat> I can't help but notice, Charmer, you're not bonding over this with us. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't want to put you guys to shame, but, like, I was born in the Mitten State. I currently reside in the Mitten State, and I think <laughs> one time I saw what land outside of the Mitten State looked like, but... Uh, that makes and sense. what was that like for you, by the way? Like, tell us what were your impressions of the non... Mitten State world that, that you got a glimpse of for, for but a brief moment. Um, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> like, every time I have to travel for work, which is more often uh, than I'd like to admit, I adore every other place. Uh, I, I probably have a bit of wanderlust, and I'm always trying to find a way out, and then my wife reminds me that that is probably not the best thing, so... Um, yeah, I like it. I like pretty much every place I've ever been that wasn't West Virginia. Nothing against West Virginia <laughs> if you're from there, but my, my experiences in West Virginia were um, breaks going out while driving down a mountain and seeing a whole lot of nothing, so I just don't have fond memories of that. Yep. Damn, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This got dark quick. Oh, there's the cat. <laughs> yeah. Whole family's here. I want to give a shout out to American. I see him in chat. That's cool. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a card reveal tonight, among other things. But I was wondering if uh, you had any favorite cards revealed so far, Pete. Uh, well, the one that I actually revealed today, I picked because I faced it. I've been doing a lot of uh, play testing on Clockwork City, particularly this week when I had time. Um, I played mm -hmm. through the first, I don't know, three or four maps, mm -hmm. and then I decided to go back and try some of them again on Master, and um, and playing that that tribal deck where they're all using assemble and every card that that the that the uh, AI is playing is buffing every other card basic basically in his hand. Um, mm -hmm. Man, that was a real that was a real challenge. Can you give us any hints how you beat it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was I, I so be, because uh, up until literally this afternoon, um, when I play on the dev account, it's a completely different account. So I like had to start over, and I'm lazy, and <laughs> so basically what I did was I just built this sort of crappy quasi uh, ramp deck. Right, okay. like it does. It doesn't even have. I'm thinking out loud now. It doesn't even have any dragons. Like it was just from back when I was first play testing, like Fall of the Dark Brotherhood, and I was yep. just like, you know, some tree minders and fighters guild recruits and thieves guild recruits, and you know, but it. it uh, but actually, the way I beat it was opportunistic Shadowfen priest turning off um, oh. you know, the guy that had gotten buffed and came out as you know some giant. 14, 16 with some <laughs> other abilities and and putting it back to a 4-4. Four, four. Um, nice. But, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. There's been a couple where I've really had to figure out, like, do some deck crafting. Like, okay, how in the hell am I going to beat, especially on Master. Um, right. It is not 
Paul is not screwing around, and, and you know, <laughs> it's not just Paul. It's, it's other guys on his team, but uh, they are not messing around with the challenge of, of some of those. There's a, there's a dragon-themed one that I was playing today that I almost uh, threw my keyboard out of my office at one point. <laughs> he was like, how am I supposed to read this damn thing? Awesome. So, so, but it's been a lot of fun. I think you guys are really going to enjoy. So for the people that may have missed it, the card that was revealed on the Bethesda stream today was the Assembled Titan. It's a new factotum. It's a unique legend. It's a six yep. cost four four. It has Assemble, but you choose two, which is different from the one preview card that we've seen before. And you either uh, get plus two, plus zero, plus zero, plus two, or deal two damage to your opponent or gain two health. Right. So you get to pick two out of those four abilities. And, you know, as, as CV, CVH and I were discussing on the stream, well, you know, like having it choose, like, why would you not just make it a six, six every time? Well, because it's a turn six drop um, and right, because right. it busts everything else in your deck. You start drawing uh, more of those and drop two or three of them, and each one is dealing two damage. All of a sudden, you know, you're threatening to deal two out of nowhere every single time, plus leave a creature on the board. Uh, you know, I mean, they're ice spikes that, that leave creatures behind. Like, that. that's not too bad. So there's a lot of different ways I think you could use them based on the kind of decks that, uh, that you're playing. One of the things Jarmer and I were talking about um, earlier tonight was... The interaction uh, between the Factotum Tribe and Galen the Shelterer, the uh, the endurance uh, legendary unique legendary card that uh, chooses a creature and item in your hand and shuffles three copies of it with plus three plus three into your deck, seems yep. like a great way to just stack more and more Factotum buffs. Yep, I mean the Factotum thing is definitely um, a, a tribal thing. <laughs> Somebody tried to get out of me today. How uh, how many are there? I said it's somewhere between. One and fifty-five. Like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not giving away any any hints how many, but there is a reasonable enough number that that they can. It, it, you're not going to build an entire deck out of them because I, I think that would be completely broken. Um, right. But uh, you you can uh, have enough of them to be you know a key part of what you could be doing with with colorless and and really making colorless almost like a sixth color that folks um, exactly. might not just be splashing for, but might, you know, be playing as one of their, as one of their main colors. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things Justin and I were also talking about earlier today was the idea of, you know, playing the Factotum with Altar of Despair. So we're keenly keeping an eye out at, uh, you know, the costs of each of these cards to see if they're the sort mm -hmm. of thing that with Altar, you can kind of keep pulling them on curve to make sure you're getting the triggers and... We also like the idea of, you know, if you're looking to build like a control style deck after this game, uh, you know, gets the expansion, Factotum might be pretty good at that. Um, the Assembled Titan, the gain two health every time you play a Factotum for the rest of the game feels really powerful uh, for stabilizing, and that's another thing that we're kind of keeping our eye on, is what kind of yeah. what kind of tools for stabilizing will that provide? Definitely. Plus, yep. as a guy who who still, even though I haven't played Paper Magic in years, still owns a Sliver deck. Like, there's a part of me that just loves the tribes that make each other that much stronger. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mentioned that, but you know, the funny thing is just how much significantly better Factotums are than Slivers, because Slivers only cared about what was on the board at any right. given moment, and as soon right. as one of those Slivers went away, that benefit left everything. In this case. All you have to do is drop it on the board. And so, you know, I was telling you guys before, like, well, I kind of got around it by silencing just enough things to not die before I did lethal. But, <laughs> you know, I, I silenced the thing on the board. But whatever buff it's provided to everything else in your hand and, and library is right. still an ongoing uh, effect that you have to worry about. So, you know, like Charmer was saying, that, you know, that two life for everyone or, or pinging for two, whatever it is. Like, yeah. man, those things really start to stack up. You get five, six, seven of them out on the board. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can blink them. Uh, they'll lose whatever buff they had when you blink them out, but you will add the buff again to everything else, which, again, you know, maybe to Charmer's point, you blink that guy out just to 
like to gain uh you know two more life uh right. yeah another yeah, but, uh, i was gonna say blinking a titan seems like just crazy value yeah yeah the the blink effects were really interesting and another thing that has been in the back of my mind is potentially a resurgence of brilliant experiment as mm. well absolutely that, which one is that again that's the three magic uh Sacrifice yep. a creature and... Um, no, a brilliant, brilliant experiment puts a copy of a creature into your hand. Oh, right, right, right. A, a friendly creature into your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is cool. This this whole factotum thing is, is one of those kinds of mechanics that just I just love to see where you couldn't do this in a paper game. Like, this is totally taking advantage yep. of the digital format, and that's exactly the sort of stuff that I, I want to see more than anything else in Legends. You know, it's been something that we've talked about, honestly, since well before this game ever came out, which was, like, we need to be willing to embrace the, um, the things we're able to do because we're, because we're digital. And yeah. to your point, like, God help you if you tried to keep track of some of this stuff with, um, <laughs> with, with counters or whatever. Like, you, you'd want to shoot yourself. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, cool. I'm actually going through the thread on Reddit to see what we've actually officially spoiled. Because there's at least one time now where I was going to reference a creature, and I'm like, oh, wait, I don't know if we spoiled that yet. So I can't. <laughs> we're doing our best here, Pete. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we I'm were... trying to remember, like, what have I actually said so far, and what have I not said? What have we not put out so far? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accidentally give out somebody's. Uh, somebody's I mean, it, uh, is, that, is that so bad? <laughs> uh, yes, for that person who was like, "Wait, you're just... <laughs> yeah, we we could send him some horse armor <laughs> as a consolation." Okay, how about this? <laughs> how about how about that? I mention the fact that it's possible that this set contains at least one type of card that's almost shape shiftery in in assuming um, any other creature type. Oh, I like that a lot. I like yeah. that a lot. I I mean I'm definitely into the tribal thing. I mean I've I kinda chose orcs as my, my personal t preference for tribes, but that's great. I like that. So so the question is that I have for you two is uh one of the things that got spoiled by who spoiled this? C V H the the Mechanar, the Yes. Yes. The the, uh, the Abomination? Yeah. So, so right now, what is the dream to create as an abomination? Ooh, that's a good question. Because you know, because it's the highest cost uh, right. thing. You know, you can't just say, "Oh, well, it's Parthenax plus right. Baldwin." Like, you know, well, then it's just <laughs> extra Parthenaxy. Like, what what kind of broken stuff have you two uh, fiends started uh, cooking up <laughs> in your little brains to to uh, hope to? to uh put together uh flesh atronach plus a charge creature is the dream <laughs> um okay. well flesh atronach won't get the bonus though i was actually thinking justin what? uh nord well because you'll take the charge text box so you won't have the flesh atronach. instead of the plus one plus. Yep. that's fair i i've been schooled here the imprisoned death lord plus a nord firebrand gives you a seven seven charge for four which feels pretty good to me <laughs> that is pretty good <laughs> um speaking of just like you know yeah it's top end but it's utterly ridiculous for me the dream would be something like odoving and tazcad because nothing says awesome like an 1818 charge breakthrough that leaves behind a creature on the board sure um, that's true that is true you know that'll close out a game or two yep yeah, absolutely uh, Chris J all day in chat uh, suggests Sweet Roll and Iron Atronach, and I'm not I'm not sure that I understand the synergy there, but I respect his moxie because that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> An Iron Atronach that if the <laughs> opponent eats it and it gets right. back full health, like you need a thirteen thirteen to make that swing. <laughs> you know what? I I need somebody to send me a screenshot of that happening. There's got to be something something good in it for somebody to pull that off. Absolutely. I'm trying to think of a way to get a sweet roll into my deck. Hmm. I got nothing at the moment. 
I'm afraid that uh, Chris J all day, your dream will have to wait until we can shuffle creatures from the board into our decks. <laughs> yeah, Maricon's over there saying Bog Lurcher plus Minotaur like he's done it before, and that also makes me <laughs> smile. <laughs> what did he do, though? He created a 9-1 charge? Um, yeah. Well, it would be a 9-1 plus the 3-2 from the Minotaur. So, yeah. really, oh, 12, it would be 12 damage 12, for 4. Yeah, with, with uh, charge yeah. and breakthrough. Uh, yeah. Seems it's pretty pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Now keep in fact, it, it, keep in mind that you're getting it for four, although you're not playing it until at least turn nine. Well, that's right? true. Maybe, that's true. maybe, maybe not. Well, how are you cheating out a mechanar before then to then drop a? still have four well there's this thing called thieves guild recruit i know it's not a fighter but thieves guild recruit oh, could true. discount the okay. cost so thieves guild recruited out and there's the six. there's the ring and there's also completed contracts that you let's just say hypothetically get off of your prophesied brotherhood slayer i know it sounds like really really out there but i've played a supreme atromancer on turn five before with weird shenanigans like this so i feel like the mechanar is also doable okay Chat, by the way, has figured out a way to get a sweet roll into my deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to return it to my hand with a with a uh, cl um, close call, yeah, close or, call. Use, sure. or use or uh, use um, brilliant experiment to get a copy of it into my hand, and then I use Galen to shuffle it into my library. So actually, it's you know, that works really nicely. I already played that stupid action assassin combo thing that Sam Pardee built. That's just <laughs> zero cost stuff that's playing yeah. all these close calls and bouncing stuff back all i need to do is is get a mechanar in there wait mm -hmm. for the sweet roll to happen yes yeah and, sweet and roll magic. costs zero i like it this is good make it we're making dreams come true here on the uh, fun right. and interactive podcast <laughs> one, of, one of the cards that mechanar makes me wish existed um that exists in you know other card game archetypes is something that instead of destroying your creature just puts it on the top of your opponent's library because that's the sort mm -hmm. of thing where you can then like set up exactly what you're getting out of your mechanar yep definitely yeah uh, I mean, here's, here's another here's a question that i i don't know why this just occurred to me but does the presence of mechanar actually give you any incentive to try playing a Doring fan in your deck <laughs> so that you can abominate it with something broken and have oh, a man. thing that can't be silenced or and, and always comes back a couple of turns later. Yes. <laughs> um, so my train of thought with that would be... I, I think no, because I don't think it would keep it beyond the first time you play it. I mean the buffs, right? I don't think it sets the base health. I think it buffs it i don't actually i don't know i'd have to see how the abo the abomination like looks when it's in your hand if it keeps the base stats then yeah i think that that would be hey, cheeky. hey maritime what what happens maritime <laughs> what happens to a, a adoring fan that we merge with a, a whatever and and we keep the adoring fan text box on on the abomination if it dies and goes away doesn't it come back later as that same card oh my god by the way, not only am I going to make this happen, I'm also going to shuffle three copies of my uh, Sweet Roll Death Machine into my deck with Galen. <laughs> plus three, plus three, yeah. <laughs> Listen, I guarantee you, I'm going to run. We're going to run a contest. We're <laughs> going to run a contest just for this card, and people will submit. Uh, you know, not just screenshots. We need like video footage proof yes. of the thing abominations you created, and have the community vote on the best one and have some like kind it. of uh, have some kind of special prize for somebody that pulls off the craziest uh, craziest right. combo. Uh, Maricon says he thinks it's a new art type that keeps it, so he thinks that the base stats will remain. And uh, I think so too. That that is interesting. Enduring fan would be pretty fantastic. I'm sure there's got to be some others uh, that could really make use of that as well. Then. If that's how that works... Somebody just said to hell with ladder. <laughs> <laughs> I, literally, I literally just broke the ranking system because now people are just screwing around in uh, casual doing stupid stuff. That's how this game should... I, that's what I like to do. <laughs> um, 
that makes me think, though, that if that's how that works with Adoring Fan, then Brasilisk is the copy, is the creature that uh, summons a copy of itself when it takes damage and survives. I want to copy Basilisk or Brasilisk with uh, my opponent's bigger creature. Ah. Yeah. That's, that's a good one, too. There's a lot of neat new mechanics, like the Brasilisk, like the uh, Galen shuffling stuff into the hand, like Mechanar. Like it seems like with this expansion, like you guys are really, like, I, I, you, it seems like you've never been afraid of like complexity creep, which I really enjoy as a guy who, you know, plays with the cards, plays all the cards, plays the worst cards possible at, towards the end of a cycle because I've run out of ideas, uh, and seeing like that more and more interesting things are coming out like relatively quickly like has been really awesome for me as a guy who just likes to build ridiculous decks. Well, I, and I think one of the th interesting things, and again, to be clear, I take 0.0, .0 credit for any of this. Like you say you guys, but I have nothing to do with it other than, right. hey, when's that card file coming over so I can see what's in the new set and, and what they've done? Um but I, I think to your point, Justin, one of the things that I think is interesting is is a card like this on its face isn't difficult to understand mechanically. I mean, right. it's not like there's nothing going on. Like, okay, well, you're mashing some numbers together and taking the higher casting costs and then making you pick a text box. But it's not overly complicated. Right, right. Kind of like Barbus, right? Like, we can have them do three things. Which one do you want them to do? But I, I think it's, you know just listen to you guys and sort of the three of us starting to goof on like, all right, what's the dream combo of two things is where some of that depth is where people find really kooky, crazy stuff that they're trying to pull off. And again, you know, to your point, like um, the, the ability to, you know, force a card to the top of an opponent's deck or even to your own deck, um, you know, is now a card that we all want because we want to sort of <laughs> set up this thing where you you, you you don't bounce it to their hand. You you uh, you know you bounce it to the top of their deck and then do something broken with it. Um, I, I think that's where some of the fun is. That it's not hard to wrap your head around what it does, but the depth that it offers you know more skilled players to do cooler things with the decks they build. I think is is kind of the balance that we try and strike. I agree with that. So. Re -re Riri Barker, one of my favorite Legends decks, deck builders, in chat says uh, that it's super intuitive for something complicated. And I think that's kind of a, yeah, a that, nice, concise I way think to it's describe a good it. Way to, especially, you know, the 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 um, you know the original version of Slivers for anybody who was playing Magic back in the day was this really complicated um, implementation because Slivers were global, so they not only affected yours, they affected your opponents, and so you got into this crazy like oh, crap, I just played a sliver that gives, you know, death touch, and now I just gave all my opponents, it, it was, you know, it sort of screwed you over uh, sometimes to play a sliver because of how, how they work. And they did a new implementation this time around that was just like, oh, yeah, duh, which is other slivers you control. Like, right. oh, right. Like how, and, and, you know, I think doing stuff like that for factotums or whatever is you know, is an interesting way for folks to do cool things, but not like the cards are keeping track of the stats for you and the abilities for you. And you're just kind of making interesting uh, choices and in, in, in terms of, you know, particularly for the modal ones, like, whoa, do you want this ability or this ability? And it's going to affect everything else that you might play later. Like, oh, cool. I get that. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that Mechanar makes me think about, right, because when he was released, there was a lot of people that were saying that they didn't remember him necessarily, you know, from the lore, and it, it got me thinking about Legends as a medium in the Elder Scrolls universe, and one of the things I like about it is because it's not, like, era-specific, we can kind of, like, dip and dive into all the different areas, but... Is there ever potentially a chance, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but is there ever potentially the chance that Legends itself would get a like specific Legends-only story that would either build out lore unique in the Elder Scrolls universe, or like we would get characters like unique to Legends that then we might see pop up in, in other games? Uh, honestly, that's a great question that I really can't answer. Fair. Um, I, I would certainly say that that I think it's it's possible. Um, 
in much the same way that um, in creating the Elder Scrolls Online, you know, there was a lot of discussion between um, the folks at Zenimax Online and Matt Fyroar and, and his team and Todd Howard and their guys where it's like, all right, we're going to do this massive uh, online game that is going to include all of Tamriel, or at least parts of all of the Tamriel provinces. Uh, but how do we do that without, you know, the BGS guys saying like, hey, don't like paint us into a corner on anything we might do down the road where like you just did something and now like I have to account for it in a later game. And so that's actually why they went backwards because they sort of knew like as long as our game leaves everything basically where it's supposed to be, we haven't changed any of the lore in subsequent games, right? Everything is sort of where it should be and the people who are supposed to be alive or dead or are still alive or dead. Um, and so, sure, I mean, I, there's there's places within the lore that, that maybe Legends folks could go um, to find stories or characters they want to bring without, without having to worry about uh, the BGS guys or the Elder Scrolls Online guys. Like, well, wait a minute, what are you doing? Like, that town doesn't exist in our game and you're talking about having it exist 100 years before this. Like... How is that possible? It can't have, you know what I mean? So it's always, uh, it's always tricky to balance. That makes sense. <clears throat> what, uh, so I know you've been with Bethesda for a long time. Uh, you've been, you know, a part of the Elder Scrolls universe as much as you're a part of a lot of the other things going on in Bethesda for a long time. Um, uh, for people who may not know a lot about you, like how did you get started with the, with the company and all of this? Um, I started at um, last month was my eighteenth the the my eighteenth year at Bethesda, so I started in uh, October of ninety nine. Um, uh, when I started, they were just the very early stages of working on Morrowind. Uh, okay. A, a, big chunk of the Morrowind team had just finished with PBA polling <laughs> for the PC and as if that makes any goddamn sense like sure you finished the bowling game make a giant wherever you want role playing game that makes absolute sense but yeah. that is in fact what a good number of them were doing before they started working on Morrowind like programmers and animators and whatever um, and so I've worked on as a matter of fact I'm one of very, very few people in the company that's actually worked a lot on every Elder Scrolls game in that period. Because, you know, folks at Bethesda Game Studios, well, by and large, they had nothing to do with Elder Scrolls Online because that was Zinimax Online. Uh, but I did a, a bunch of stuff for that for, for years and, and still do. And then obviously, you know, pretty have been pretty heavily involved at various stages on, on Legends. So, um, you know, it's definitely something that I'm fond of and have a love for, but in ways that are very different from a lot of other people. Um, and what I mean by that is, like, um, my worst subject by far in school was history. I was horrible at it. And history is just names and uh, places and dates, which is all canon and lore is. Like, it's just who did what, when, to whom, and what, right? So people ask me questions all the time like you know you were saying <laughs> uh charmer is asking about like hey well could you ever use like people who aren't in elder scrolls because you know right now you're kind of using folks in games like i don't even remember who half of these folks are when i see the cards like, who the hell is mechanar like i was that guy in one of our games what game is that like i i don't know i don't remember any of that stuff and it's partially because i'm just stupid but it's also <laughs> because for things that I'm not stupid about, I just have a horrible memory. Like, I can't remember anything. Um, yeah. I, I have a terrible, uh, terrible memory. Um, and so, yeah, like, what matters to me is not the, um, the specifics of, like, it matters to me from the standpoint that the people who are supposed to pay attention to that stuff are doing their job paying attention to that. Nobody gives a, nobody comes to me by and large about anything like hey do you remember like what the like you're asking the wrong dude you're at 
somebody from the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages sent me a question about like the name of some random ass place on some really old map and what was the actual name. I was like, oh, you have got to be kidding me! Like, <laughs> um, you, you know what? What I'm much more vested in and um, uh, and sort of, I guess, knowledgeable about maybe is a bad is a is a bad way of putting it, but like. I understand for all of these games where they come from. So, uh, except for Morrowind, which I joined in the very early stages, every other Elder Scrolls game, like my first experience with it was having lunch with Todd Howard or sitting his office or somewhere, and he would be like, okay, like I'm going to pitch you on here's the idea for the next Elder Scrolls game and like where it's going to be and what the story is going to be and like features and stuff, you know? So, like from the, I, I saw it when it was first, like, sketches on the back of a napkin or just a conversation over a sandwich at lunch um and so sort of seeing how each iteration has changed and hearing the different guys on the team you know guys like uh Eastvon and matt carafano come up with like this is the look and feel that we want to go for and how this part of the world is going to be different or special or what we're trying to do with you know the architecture or the the clothing or or the creatures or whatever like that's what matters most because like i spend so many hours playing that stuff like play testing that stuff talking to people about that stuff um that that kind of feel of what feels right is much more inherent to me than like what race was that character from that like i have no idea <laughs> don't i i don't know so don't ask that's really cool, man. I think a lot of people would agree that you have one of the coolest jobs on the planet. <laughs> it's not bad. I'll give you that. <laughs> so I uh, go ahead, man. Oh. Well, no, real quick. I, I got to tell Pete. I, I told Charmer this the other day. Um, my mom watches Vice News, and she <laughs> and she oh. she called me the other day, and she's like. I think I just saw that man that, whose stream you were on the other day on tw that twi Twitter thing. I was like, it's it's Twitch. And uh, <laughs> she wanted me to tell you that you did a great job on that interview and she supports what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's nice of you. Yeah. Cool to hear. So I was going to say that, uh, you know, there are some cards that we've talked about for the new set you know, fact totems, but there is this other ability that was teased quite a bit um, mm -hmm. with the initial article that you guys released, and that was the treasure hunting, uh, like, I guess yep. uh, ability word is is the right way to say Yes, it. correct. It's not a thing you can steal. Right, it's not a keyword. It's like a, an ability word. Um, but we yep, haven't like really silver. seen we haven't really seen much uh, since then, so I felt like maybe we should rectify that now, right? Yeah, maybe, I totally agree. Maybe we should, you know, mention you know this set uh, we get the alternate art swims at night who looks very piratey, and we have treasure hunting which is piratey. So mm -hmm. maybe now would be a good time for us to talk about uh, a treasure map. R. Arr. Ahoy. Ahoy. By the way, I still have a, a uh, pirate costume. I'm ready for this. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Treasure Map is going to be our reveal for the evening. And uh, for the people who are listening to this in the future, hello, time travelers. Uh, this is a three cost neutral item. It gives creatures plus one plus one. And it has a summon effect of draw a card. But if the wielder has Treasure Hunt, Instead, draw something that they are hunting for instead. Mmm. This is an absolutely fascinating card. Charm and I were talking about how, on it, on the surface, it's reasonable value, plus one, plus one, draw a card. Uh, screws up combat math for your, for your opponent, always a plus. But, I mean, this second ability is just the nuts, right? Because, like, uh, depending on what we get... Uh, as far as treasure hunt support goes, um, this is the most effective, cheapest tutor card in the game. Yes, and and in particular, 
like the ability to play and again th- this is you know I, I i'm more interested in charmer's take than my take but w- when i read it the thing that i find interesting is the ability to play a card a treasure hunt card that's looking for something that your deck is not really playing so looking for an item in a deck that's really heavy on actions where you you don't want to play lots of items just to trigger the treasure hunt but you want to play you know you know a mentor ring or a you know a, a couple of maybe key cards where this goes and finds them mm-hmm. for you when you really want it and not just like oh i never get to trigger this because like i never draw items because my deck doesn't have a lot yeah yeah this is an absolutely amazing card for that sort of thing so i'm actually really glad that maricon's in the chat because while i think this works a certain way I actually have some questions about it just based on the wording because my first thought when I looked at it was just that this is going to draw said, you know, treasure hunted item from the deck. But I'm realizing, you know, after Justin and I had talked about it earlier today, that cards like Battle Mage's Onslaught will say, like, draw an item, an action, etc. And, it doesn't specify from your deck. And right. uh, and doesn't specify from the deck, and this one doesn't either. So the two things I'm curious about with this are, one, whether this is from the deck or random, and then two, it says something that they're hunting for, and what I'm curious about is if it's a creature that is hunting for more than one thing, but you've already satisfied one condition. So like, let's say my creature needs an item and an action, but I've already drawn one action. Will this always find the second half in an item, or does it have like a believe, 50-50 shot? No, I believe the the answer to your question, I thought, was that because you're, you've already found one, you're no longer actually hunting for that anymore, because you've satisf- satisfied the requirement. Yeah. So, so Maricon says, yes, it is from your deck, so th- that answers your question, which is, Playing a treasure map on a creature that's treasure hunting for an item and having no items in your deck. Uh, well, I guess that's a bad example. For an action and you have no <laughs> actions in your deck. Yeah, because it is the actual item. I'm stupid. I already said I was yeah. stupid. So everything else is caveated. But, um, but it also, from a condition standpoint, it's no longer considered looking for an item it's already found. So it would go to whatever the next, uh, the next thing is. And again, going back to my... Hey, did we talk about that card yet or not? Uh, I don't think we talked about it, so I can't I can't say anything more. We're getting closer, Charmer. Yeah, we're getting closer. So, <laughs> so from, from my own personal point of view, I actually think that since this does work the way I thought it did, I think this card is very powerful. Um, yeah. I think it's certainly a lot more powerful than it might appear on first glance because If you've ever played another card game, the ability to tutor, and that's a magic term, but the ability to, like, search your deck for any specific card is very, very strong. There's a reason that cards like Goblin Skulk are so powerful in Legends. Even though it's just finding zero-cost cards, you can build your deck in a way where you guarantee what you draw. And this has the potential, depending on... Uh, which treasure hunt cards exist so that's going to be like the big caveat but this has the potential to really help people find combo pieces and then even if you've already found them you still get to draw a card Um, it's it's colorless it's neutral so card draw or this kind of cycle in a neutral color is also very strong Um, I like this a lot by the way we we have spoiled the card that I was thinking of the specific card that I was wondering if we had talked about was Ratway Prospector and so (laughs) That, that is one of those cards that has multiple things that it is hunting for. So, you know, if you've already found an action and then you've drawn this, and it is fair to point out that you could play this on a thing without having drawn it because it could be in your open hand. And so you're playing it, but you actually haven't fulfilled the hunt requirement because the hunt requirement is not playing it. It's actually drawing it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, that it, it will allow you to fulfill that last one, which is support, right? Most folks don't want to play a ton of supports in their deck just right. to get the buff for this. But playing a treasure hunt makes getting that last of the three ones far easier because that could be the only thing it's now hunting for if you've played an action and, and you know, and you, or you've drawn an action and, and this item. 
Absolutely. And then this to me is exactly the sort of like support. I mean, not to use the wrong word because we we're just talking about sports, but the kind of support card uh, that I love seeing in neutral. I, you know, you talked about neutral being the fifth, the sixth color, and I think that's really cool and important too. But this is the kind of card that, like Altar of Despair, is going to inspire like hours of deck building from people all over, you know, the Legends community. I love it. Yeah. Yep. Justin and I were talking about that even without Treasure Hunt, the fact that this is in neutral um we feel like this has the potential to be like tome of alteration um but maybe even potentially better and we really like it in arena uh as well mm -hmm. yeah absolutely the just the small plus one i mean like the potential of getting a two for one out of this is amazing um and, and potentially even a three for one right like you play it on your guy that your opponent was planning on trading into or trading with you get to draw a card, you get to survive combat, and then you get to trade again. Like, there's a ton of value here in a, in a pretty small, interesting card. Yep. So, uh, how many uh, how many more treasure hunters are we going to see, Pete? Somewhere between <laughs> one and fifty-five. <laughs> Fair enough. Too That's soon. my so, answer for everything. So, now. <laughs> so you heard it here first, folks. There's at least one more treasure hunter because that we said correct. how many more. Kappa. That is oh. oh, stepping up our game here. Yeah, speaking of like trying to make Pete slip up, do you ever like rue the day that your team named a place elsewhere, like the Khajiit <laughs> homeland? Because that's got to breed like horrible. You know, hey, is is Elder Scrolls Six going to take place in this random location, or or is it going to take place elsewhere? And in your head, you're like, oh, well, it's going to you know be elsewhere, and you're like, oh wait, I just committed to. Like, I feel like naming, like, that's a naming trap. No, because you, you attempting to answer the question the way that you did is a rookie mistake. Like, the <laughs> answer is actually, I'm not talking about the Elder Scrolls Six until we announce it. That's the right answer. Well, that's, that's because you're a veteran, you know. You are correct, sir. So, that, I don't care what the places are called because I'm not getting trapped because I'm not even attempting to give context. I mean, that's, that's also fair. Yeah. Uh, that is fair, too. <clears throat> um, so one of the things we like to do uh, on the uh, podcast is take questions from the audience. Yeah, it's about mm -hmm. that time. Um, so if you guys have something you want to ask, and, and we, we give this disclaimer every episode, so I'm sorry, Pete. Uh, you don't have to ask about Elder Scrolls Legends if you don't want to. We'll talk about anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, well, sure, I like about this podcast. Way. It goes all over the place. It does. It does. <laughs> I'm glad somebody appreciates it because, man, sometimes I listen back to it and I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we we got uh, t uh, Tunis asks, why a neutral round bottom left corner? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it does have a little color icon on the uh, on the card there, doesn't it? Uh, Paul. Well, while we wait for Paul to answer that one, <laughs> uh, Polly McCoy asks, "What kind of ice cream is Pete's favorite?" Uh, Baskin Robbins Gold Medal Ribbon. What's in Gold Medal Ribbon? It is chocolate and vanilla and caramel, like swirl. Nice. Um, Riri Barker asks, "Do you believe in true love?" I think this is for everybody. So anybody I, I wants think to go it's for you, boys. <laughs> Uh, I believe in true love. I'm getting married in May, and I am in love. I, uh, I've i been married now for 10 years. I've been with my wife for, it'll be 17 years in December, but she Ow. is now asleep, so I can say no. Absolutely not. <laughs> she's always, she's always uh, you know, on notice. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm with her until, until I die, and I will definitely die before her because I live a reckless, reckless life. <laughs> good times man good times by the way did you guys see Maricon answered your uh, the symbol question there below Maricon writes we are going to do that now to indicate what neutral what is neutral because of the fabricant cycle in the Skyrim card dynamo that references in game text okay I like it yeah so that, that little symbol if you notice is on at least like on the the fabricants okay it, it references if you have a a symbol and it has that symbol which matches the one in the bottom left so that's 
that's what Paul's talking about, which is if you have a card that has that symbol in the corner, that's how you know that you've fulfilled the requirement. I like it. Yeah, I like it. It's going to get nice and intuitive for potential new players. Drabberfawn535 has a question, which reminds me of something, an idea we'd like to pitch to you. Um, this is something we talked about a couple episodes ago. We want a 10-card expansion where it's 10 unique legendaries, and they're all different versions of Mike the Liar. <laughs> um, negotiations Mike. with Mike have proven to be very difficult. Um, he uh, always promises he's going to show up to VO sessions and never actually does. Um, he promises to show up for card art uh, sessions and never has. So I, I will say we have done everything we can to try and get Mike into the game. But working with a liar is just very, very difficult. That's I mean, a good answer. He very well may be in the game. We just don't know because he's lying about it. He claims that he is, but <laughs> again, he's just completely unreliable. <laughs> Making this sure... one is adoring fast. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure I don't miss one. Uh, Peters89 asks, what's Pete's go-to karaoke song? I do not do karaoke. <laughs> That's fair. I haven't done it since I quit drinking, so I... <laughs> <laughs> I, can relate. I can relate to that. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? Um, the Adventures of Dust asks, what is your favorite card released from the set so far? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to have to go with, uh, personally, my favorite card revealed so far is Galen the Shelterer, because uh, I plan on doing some pretty ridiculous stuff, shuffling extra copies of cards into my deck. That, that's a good one. Um, for me, this might like come as a surprise, but the Phalanx Exemplar that was just revealed today is surprisingly good for any mid-range deck that runs Willpower. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's a 5 cost 5-6 with Guard, and when your opponent draws a Prophecy when you break a Rune, it puts one of the 0 cost 1-2 Septums with Guard into your hand. Um, I don't think this is a control card. I think it's very, very much a mid-range card meant to beat people in the face with high stats, and I'm a big fan. I can't wait to abuse it. I mean, you get that out along with the Dark Guardian, you just start getting value all over the place when you're attacking, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and seeing the, um, you know, as new cards are introduced to interact with when your opponent triggers a prophecy has been really cool for me, too. It's something I was talking about back in closed beta, and I'm really glad to see coming out. Uh, Adelwar writes, Pete, what game set you on the video game making path? That this is what made this what you wanted to do? Well, in fairness, it's important to note that I don't really make, I, I don't really make games. I don't make games. Um, I provide a lot of feedback to do. I, you know, I'm involved from the point at which they, they have an idea and shepherd that, shepherding that all the way to get, having a green lit, which means it gets funded. Um, all the way through the development, launching in, and afterwards. So, like, the very first time anybody from Bethesda played a version of Legends, like what you guys are playing, it was Paul and I sitting down at a, at a table in Hunt Valley with some printed cards and um, him explaining how it worked and what runes were and how prophecy worked. And um, So I get to do stuff like that, but I, I'm not a designer or a programmer. I, I never have been. Um, uh, you know, what set me on wanting to be, I mean, video games as a love was, um, my first computer was a VIC-20, uh, which neither of you was alive when the VIC-20 <laughs> existed. Um, uh, but it was a absolute piece of crap computer in the, in the very early days. It predated the Commodore 64, um, yeah. And they used to do a magazine called Run Magazine that would print um, code for little programs that you could type in. And my brother and I would get every issue and we would flip through looking for cool little games and we'd take turns uh, sitting down and typing in code and then going through and debugging it, which was basically, you know, you'd, you'd press run and then it would say, you know, line 86, whatever, and you'd have to go through and find line 86 and figure out what, what you typed wrong. And we'd play these crappy little games. Uh, I got a I got a cassette drive 
um, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was an old cassette tape that was the only way you could actually store stuff to use again later uh, <laughs> because there was no memory on this stupid thing. Um, but I just had an absolute love for games and, and, uh, and gaming. It was something I spent a ton of time uh, doing. And, you know, I worked for a number of years for a gaming website as a part-time job while I did my my full-time career and also went to MBA school. And Bethesda was my chance to sort of combine multiple jobs into into one. And I've been here ever since. Cool. Great. So I got one quick one that I'm actually going to like pitch quick to Maricon and maybe he'll answer in chat. Somebody wanted some clarification on whether neutral supports and items will trigger with the neutral synergy fabricants. I'm pretty sure supports do because it just says neutral card and those are clearly on the board. The items are one that might require some clarification. And then uh, immediately after that we had, uh, do we think that legends will ever have mechanics that force your opponent to discard things like Hypnotic Spectre from Magic. And to that, I would say, like, obviously, Maricon will answer that better, but um, I think that we already have it in Barter, but I think that that's about as close as we're going to get because, in all honesty, discard mechanics just aren't very fun to be on the receiving end. And so un bad. And unlike Magic, we don't have counter spells, So you can't defend yourself, and if, it, it'll never be supported as a full archetype. It'll never be the sort of thing where... Um, your opponent can just keep making you discard because like nobody likes to lose like that. It just feels bad for one player. Um, it's the same reason why people have asked me and I don't think we'll ever see the equivalent of like land destruction and there's a reason that magic also got away from that because it just feels bad when you're the player sitting there doing nothing. Like nobody likes to just pass their turn until they lose. So, Yep. Actually the only time that they do land destruction that's even remotely relevant now is like when you have a set like like this one where you've got these flip cards that you start off as a land and then if you meet a certain requirement they flip into this to this other thing and so having something that destroys a land is like incredibly narrow corner case relevant. But yeah, to your point, like it just it's We've had some cards in not so recent history where the biggest complaint was actually the like the helplessness of you having to play against that card and how am I supposed to stop this what this is doing like there's there's nothing I can do and this card is, is uh, Charmer I think your point is spot on which is what exactly are you supposed to do to protect or defend yourself against against this card, right because we don't we don't have mana. So you can't hold on to extra lands just in case, you know, you, you need to pitch lands. Like, it's just a feel-bad moment. Yeah, I totally agree. And by the way, we should also never do any kind of counter spell or that, like... Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I think that the uh, the rune mechanics and the prophecies are the perfect amount of interaction, you know, that keeps the game... <clears throat> Tense creates that tension that, that makes for like suspenseful gameplay while uh, also allowing you to not like hate every time that your opponent might counter your spell, might discard your spell, might get rid of your cool combo piece. I think it's a pretty perfect balance. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to see. So, Dribberfawn535 asks Can we get a Morrowind style mud crab in the game, please? Uh, ask Marathon. <laughs> got it. got it um let's see here um yeah i will just get this one out of the way because i'm sure if we don't it'll come back so uh, i guess i'll apologize in advance uh ray ray also justin he informed me it's ray ray not ray ray i made that mistake. oh man i made that mistake for a long time as well um, We've been screwing up for 12 episodes now. Yeah. Uh, Ray Ray Barker <laughs> says, I hate to be that guy because it's been asked a lot, but without pressure, judgment, or expectation, are there any plans to develop a competitive Legends play scene in the future? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, obviously I can't speak to Pete, but um, they're, they've been doing more with, uh, like, the ESL series, and... Uh, we've been getting more and more gauntlets. I think those are at least indicators that we're going in that direction. But there, there's also somebody 
somebody was asking the other day, like, well, how come Clockwork City didn't come out a month earlier? Like, we've actually done some things behind the scenes on the back end. Um, not everything, but a number of things that were really important for us to be able to have in order to do uh, esports down the road uh, in terms of uh, you know, results tracking and just really basic fundamental stuff that, you know, even other games that are doing esports stuff now um, either don't do or don't do well that um, still cause problems for people trying to run um, tournaments because they can't, you know, like the notion of if you don't take a screenshot, how do I actually know who won between Justin and Charmer? Somebody take a screenshot. I forgot to. It didn't work. I was too late. Now what? Like, yeah. uh, long right. pause. What? Right. So yeah. Yeah. doing doing more things that you honestly you guys won't ever see until um, until those things come online. But they have to be there uh, now and and along the way for us to be able to do those things later. So you know, yeah, we are trying to do. Um, you know, more stuff with ESL. Um, I do want that to be a thing, but, you know, I'll be perfectly uh, candid, which is I think that's an important thing to do, and that's really important to folks like Charmer and Justin and CVH and any number of you who are into the competitive scene. But there's also stuff that's hugely important that none of you guys care about because you, you haven't seen it in forever which is um, onboarding stuff. What is it like for a right. new player? How to make the game um, less uh, friction-full and more friction-free? And, like, well, when's the last time either of you, like, started the game from scratch? Like, two years ago now? Like, I mean, so if we're making changes or tweaks or trying to improve stuff to make the game better and stickier for new players to get more people into the game... Um, you guys aren't ever going to see that. Like, you don't even know that stuff is going on. But we definitely do because we're – so we're trying to sort of please a lot of people. And we can't just say let's just focus on competitive esports stuff because what if that actually starts to, to blow up and lots of people want to watch? And then they go to play the game and the onboarding isn't great and they never make it into the game that we all know and love. Like, well, that's a problem. So we, we sort of need to we need to uh, treat things in a variety of different ways and sort of float all the boats, right? To to put ourselves on a path for better, um, broader esports uh, support. Um, uh, you know, I've enjoyed everything that I've watched so far that's been done, even with the little stuff. But I, you know, I want to. Uh, to, to see that stuff do well. It's a it's a mandate and a directive I've given to folks on my team to say we need to be having these conversations and figuring these things out. And, um, you know, I, I, these guys can't say, but, you know, I do talk to folks on my team like G Staff and, and Solid Age and tell them, you know, you guys need to be going to have a conversation with a Justin, a Charmer, a CVH. You know, we tweak some of the rules in the ESL Go stuff and before we gave feedback, I made sure that we went out to some of the folks in the community just to get a sanity check for, hey, hey what do you guys think about this, that, or the other? Because we yeah. want the community to be involved in how that grows and, and where it ultimately um, gets to because you guys are going to be the one competing. You can yeah. confirm I've received those emails, definitely. Yeah, I want to I wanna say... First of all, let me let me preface this by saying that what I'm about to say is entirely my opinion and does not reflect the opinions or views of anyone else, and I'm probably in the minority, but um, I'm actually really glad that you guys are taking a little bit more time with the esports scene because, you know, uh, I have no problems with just saying, like, you know, I, I play a lot of games. I've certainly tried out your competitors, and I know that one of the examples is, like, Hand of the Gods is getting a lot of motion because they're still in beta and they threw out some, like, $50,000 tournament, right? But, like, I mm -hmm. went and I tried their game, and it was buggy. Like, I tried filming something for YouTube, and it crashed on me twice, and then when I tried it, like, the game didn't feel balanced. The theme didn't match the mechanics, and, like, I said it then, and I stand by it now. 
if if that game didn't have the tournament attached to it, like nobody would even care or talk about that game. And I'm much happier that with this game, and that's the reason I keep coming back to it, like the mechanics are sound. I think the dev the design is solid. It's something that I enjoy playing and I would much rather have something like have that as the foundation and then get built on as opposed to just throwing money at uh, a shitty game, to be honest. So I'm, I'm personally happy, you know, if I got to wait a little bit longer, but you guys get it right. Like I, I would much rather have that than the alternative. So. Yep. I totally agree, man. And that was my experience with that game as well. Like I hopped in, the game was broken. I left <laughs> and I don't, I, and I don't plan on going back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, again, I, I just want to highlight, like, we we are spending a lot of time in parts of the game where a lot of the folks, you know, particularly, like, you know, Maricon and I are constantly lurking and occasionally participating in Reddit, as are lots of devs and other folks. Um, but, you know, we see what everybody's saying, but the truth of the matter is there's any number of things that we do that simply won't be visible to folks on Reddit, but will be beneficial to folks on Reddit, because ultimately what we're trying to do is maintain and grow the long-term health of this game uh, across the board so I, I think it's a good question and and uh, i'm happy to talk about it yeah. let me ask you a question about reddit if you don't mind yeah. um, <laughs> my favorite part of reddit is like the shit posts where it's just like stupid screenshots or memes and stuff like that mm -hmm. like the, the intellectual discussion is great i mean like i, I love talking about games but i gotta ask like what's your favorite part of reddit <laughs> Um, I mean, in general, you, you know, my, uh, introduction, my, uh, foray into community management was, uh, putting up the very first, um, bulletin boards for the Elder Scrolls for Morrowind and being the, the chief moderator, like I was the entire department at Bethesda in case I hadn't mentioned that one. Like, I was it. I was the PR person, the marketing person, the community person. I, I did, if I didn't do it, nobody was doing it. And so my interaction with, with fans goes back to being on the forums and talking to folks and getting questions. You know, Twitter was, was nowhere to be found or, or any of these other ways. And so, you know, I, I do like that aspect of um, Reddit. I do like being able to engage in conversation and other folks to be able to jump in and participate and share ideas. Um, you know, obviously where I'm, I enjoy it the most is usually one of two things, either, um, or maybe three people posting things that's sort of either cool or funny or just plain ridiculous, like some idiot talking about a new card as it relates to like an old, uh, commercial for like cleaning up messes. <laughs> God damn it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I just think I love that stuff because it's nothing but, a, like, a love for the game and, like, yeah. fun ways to express it and talk about it. Or, like, you know, like, uh, you know, look at this crazy combo I pulled off or, you know, the biggest – like, I, I think all that stuff is great. I, I like being able to see, you know, what other people are doing with the game and how they're having fun. Um yeah. And I enjoy any and all of the feedback that is, um, uh, like, res respectful. Uh, and by that I mean, like, you can be pissed off. You can be really angry, but still be respectful. And I'll listen to everything that you have to say, and I will take it seriously. I will mention stuff to other people on my team or people on Paul's team or whatever if I think it's something important. Um that if you can be rational and make an argument and say why you're upset uh, or what you don't like, um, cool. Like I, I'm, we're we're big boys and girls. Like we've been doing this for a long time. Um, feedback, uh, critical feedback, is really important. But there's a difference um, between that and like whining. And so, <laughs> um, for the yeah. most part, though, I mean, truth be told, like. I mean, here, there, like, look, when the Twitch drop stuff changed, like, there was a lot of whining. I mean, there, there was. Um, it was? But I understand, right. I understand why. It was a concern of ours. Um, but, like, it was complaining about how much free stuff I'm giving you beyond 
the free stuff I'm already giving you. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I know what you mean. Like, it, so, so it's not as much free stuff as the free stuff that you were getting before, but it's, it's still free. Um, but in general, look, I, I really like Reddit. I think the Legends Reddit community is one of the healthier, more respectful ones I've ever seen or been a, a part of. Um, I think both of you guys are honestly a, a big part of that. I mean, one of the things that I really like is, um, you know, that I, I think and expect that you guys will tell us what you think, good, bad, or indifferent. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I don't expect Charmer is always just going to be charming. Like, sometimes he will say... I'm annoyed by this, or this is a problem, or this is dumb. But he always does it in a way that, like, yeah. it's got a point. Um, or, you know, Justin or CVH or right. Dust or any number of folks. Like, I, I think in particular that the sort of the – some of the more notable names in our <clears throat> in our community and the ones that stream and play the game a lot are um, – are really good at sort of setting an example on this is how you get feedback and get things to, to change. And honestly, also, you guys tend to make better arguments for things that, that get derailed than we ever could, right? So when Unstoppable Rage is a giant um, cluster, like, you don't really need me to step, step in and go, guys, it's actually not that. It's not like when it, when it blows you out, it really hurts but there's also plenty of ways to play around it or to do, you know what I mean? But you guys right, do a right. way better job of that than I do because you play against these things. Like if it was really broken, Charmer would not stop bitching about <laughs> the need to, to change that card, right? He wouldn't. He'd be like, yeah. look, this is affecting my ability to play or I don't want to have to play that stupid card just because it's so broken. But he's a smart dude. He knows how to build yeah. decks that, that deal with the unstoppable rage. And so you guys <laughs> speaking to the, to the community about – Dude, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's really not that broken. Um, you know, yeah. here's ways to play around it. I, I think is part of what makes um, is it makes our Reddit community so so valuable. I real quick, I gotta be clear. Let me clear that Charmer actually is the guy who convinced me that Unstoppable Rage was okay. Yeah. <laughs> Him and I got got into a couple of arguments over that, and he eventually eventually came I can't over. Remember. I did. So we're going to try to catch up a bit because there's a ton coming in. So I'm going to rapid fire through some. Uh, quick, yeah. Uncle Pete, what did your doggo eat that caused uh, so much in damage? We're referencing that tweet you had the other day. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. He ate a pair of my wife's Le Boutons that I bought her for Christmas. As a very spe My wife is very short and she loves high heels. And I bought her a very expensive pair of Le Boutons, which Muggsy ate. Um, he ate a pair of my Sony Bluetooth headphones. He ate my wife, one of my wife's Kindles. Um, he's uh, uh, like, you know, the, the list is, is piled up to the point where we leave nothing out anymore that he can, he can get to. Fair. The, the Lebutons put us at a, at a grand, uh, with a bullet. So the other $500 was <laughs> In incidental. Damn, well, dude. it was a lot more stuff, right? Yeah. The shoes was one incident uh, that almost got him killed, and uh, and the rest was a lot of small incidents. Sandra likes to tell a story about this dog. Like, uh, her family in Mexico has this dog, or did, who uh, who exclusively ate Coca Cola and tortillas, and <laughs> lived to be like nineteen years old, right? Like this just unkillable wow. dog, right? Like. I think about that. that. That's that's actually kind of inspiring to me. Like, I'd like to be that dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pete's probably not going to be able to answer this. This is probably more like a, a American question. But Stephanie MG has asked, uh, if we're looking into other mechanics that add more depth, uh, specifically things that either interact on your opponent's turns like traps or maybe like face down cards or, or similar mechanics from like magic. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, right now, honestly, I think we already have a great way to do that, which is prophecies. And there may be any number of things we're not currently doing with prophecies that we could. I mean, you could put prophecy on an item if you wanted to, and there is make a guard suddenly. Like... Right? Like, I, <laughs> right? Sorry, there's there is one. Right? The right, right. The spear. spear. Yeah. Spear of embers. 
but I mean, we could do more of that stuff, or we could do prophecy supports, or we like there's other stuff. But I think we already have a really good mechanic that makes your attacks and the order in which you attack, or whether you attack, um, uh, already like really strategic. I don't know if we need to add like a new thing in the game that doesn't currently exist, but uh, you know what? Like, again, not really my department, but just as I play it, I see lots more design space for these guys to play in with what we've already got. I think and see, and Maricon just said what Pete said, so yeah. I was right on that one. And that's that's uh, that's legit and what I would have expected. I also, I saw a couple people ask, and I know it's something, you know, talking about that honest feedback, I know it's something that I've called for um, just as a, as the weirdo I am. Is there any um, plans at some point, whether it's near or far future, to do some more with uh, either cosmetics, so we're thinking like custom avatars or things, or... Oh my god. Or it... uh, one of the other things, just because of what, you know, Direwolf's other product does, like the idea of like custom emotes or things like that, or just ways to like personalize and spice up your account. Yes. There you go, see? I have been beating that drum way louder than any of you for way longer than any of you. So, uh, whether it's avatars or deck icons, like, that's a minor one, but always, like, I'm trying to find new cool ways to I, distinguish the different decks that I play in my giant list. Or, yeah, there's a lot, I mean, the game itself, the, the, the play field, you know, we're going to add some more... Um, uh, play mats, uh, scrolls like we did uh, when we did the little etchings. There's going to be some more of those for Clockwork City, but I think there's bigger, larger uh, scale stuff that we want to do all across the board. So yes to what you said. Hey Pete, I would pay twenty dollars if my avatar could say "Howdy, folks." <laughs> yeah. By the way, somebody just made a great comment that that I totally agree with, Corchy the Great, which is. Uh, emotes that don't make you sound like a sarcastic dick. Like, there's been any number of times <laughs> yeah. where I genuinely, like, want to say sorry, but based on whatever avatar I've got, I say something like, oh, that that just made me sound like an yeah. asshole. Like, no, yeah. I, like, oops. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I totally agree. Like, we uh, we need we need a little more precision in some of our emotes sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I can say personally... Um, I'm one of those people that, you know, in my teens and 20s, I worked at a comic and gaming shop. I've got that weird, like, collectionist bug in me. So if you guys, yep. if you guys randomly put out a bunch of new avatars, like, I'm the kind of guy who's going to buy them all. If you guys had emotes, I will literally pay money for an emote that I will never use just because I want it. And, you know, the same way. I, I love you guys, and I like trying to find excuses to throw money at you. Like, I've already pre-ordered. I, I do that every time, so... Uh, You're yeah. a good man, Charlie Brown. If uh, if you guys ever want some uh, either vague or very specific feedback on kinds of cosmetic stuff, somebody can feel free to to email me or message me, and I'd be happy to help. We, we definitely will. But I I can tell you that we have had a laundry list for a while of things that we would really like to do to just allow for a little bit more personalization. Here, do you want to do you want to do an experiment? Right now, while we're we're talking about this, I want to bounce an idea off you guys and just and just see what you what you think. Let's do it. Uh, Maricon's gonna kill me. For <laughs> it, but, but, so I, because it's it's a completely has nothing to do with the game or win more mechanic or anything sure. else, and it's just this, which is um, we we one of the things we're continuing to do is to always try and improve. Uh, some of the uh, like the uh, premium effects on things, you know, so it's cool and it's sparkly and um, you know you open one of those and you feel like oh that, like that's a pretty that's an even badass better badass version of the art because like it looks like the fire is raining down or the whatever right yeah mm -hmm. so I had an idea for what if we uh, gave you a way that you could just bling out cards right. That you could just like if you had you for whatever you could take a card that you play all the time in your decks and make you know the sparkly premium version rather than having to craft it or open it. But once you do it, that card is like untrappable. Uh, 
So you mm. can't like game the system and be like, oh, I can get more soul gems by spending a buck and taking this legendary and turning it into a premium, and then I trap it and I get enough. You know what I mean? But like, I like this. If it just blinged out cards, if you could just take little like gems and just be like, I'm gonna bling that card. I'm gonna bling my on Gollum. I'm gonna bling this. Like, is that something you guys are interested in? Or is it like, ah, you know, the cards and the premium thing? Like, I'd rather have avatars. And This is funny because no, we're going to have a split answer here. You go first, Justin. I, I like this idea. I mean, like, I'm a guy who, despite being a man in my 30s with a responsible job, has stickers on the back of his cell phone case. <laughs> like, I would totally get behind this. Wow, that was not what I was expecting at all. Because normally him and I talk about, like, he doesn't like premiums. Yeah. And I'm, like, Captain Premium. But we have different... No, but if I if I could get like just something really cool and unique that I felt like spoke to me about one card, I'd do that. Just like the Avatar thing, like I think we're on board with that. Yeah. I mean, I and tracked my. Way, uh... Somebody in chat said like, "Well, I'd rather have avatars." Like, this is not an either or. This was just a like we were kicking around like things that we could do that were more cosmetic, like avatars or whatever. You know, we we've talked about the card back thing, but with our UI, like, well, it's not really a thing. Yeah. Uh, that, you that never you see, see it. Much. Yeah. But we were just sort of spitballing it. You know, since you're saying like, well, we'd like to chime in. I'm just kind of curious and I'm sort of reading some of the stuff and chat. Like, is that the kind of thing that folks would be interested in? Or is it like, ah, well, like the way it works now is fine. And um, yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I would personally be interested in it. Uh, I, I, I'm not as uh, far into my premium collection as CVH is just because my schedule prohibits me. But I spend all of my gems on premiums unlike justin and i do it twofold one again it's that collectionist in me i like i want them all but also i you know i kind of like semi consider myself an ambassador for the game and so if a new player wanders in i want them to see like hey this is how awesome the art is because by the way you guys have a fantastic art um but like i i kind of want it to to show off like what what the potential could be um, if you guys had anything that would allow for, like, Gwent has a similar system. They actually introduced a third type of currency. So, like, they had their crafting material, and then they had their stuff that you, like, buy packs with. But they introduced a third thing that was specifically for just taking your non-premiums and turning them into premiums. And I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of a cool uh, idea. And I, I know that I would use it. I would, I would use the heck out of whatever system you gave me to make things, like, super shiny or alternate hey. art or whatever the case may be. There you go. We just did a little focus test during the podcast. Um, I was just curious. Like, I, I, I'm i not telling you that this is coming tomorrow or ever. Yeah. I was just, like, we kicked it around and we sort of went back and forth how much folks care about it. And, you know, we do some, some surveys to, to current and lapsed players every now and then. But I was just kind of curious what your what your take was. Uh, sure. Still trying to play catch-up. Um uh, Swoderman asked if there would ever be uh, either a more officially supported deck tracker. Uh, I assume he means either something made by you yeah. or Direwolf. Um, it's on our list. On your list. Good to know. Um... I know that earlier uh, Zombie Hunter 9x19 wanted to know what uh, Pete's favorite beer is. Uh... On the very rare occasions that I drink beer, it's usually Blue Moon. This is not beer. Uh, I mean, unless you mean root beer and diet, which I don't think you did. Uh, in which case, IBC Diet Root Beer is my favorite. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm trying to scroll through because I know that some of the people were asking stuff about like plans for design, but I see Maricons being a champ and answering a bunch of those. He so I'm trying to find... Camp. Uh, somebody did comment, Pete, I'm sorry, I don't think you have a dog that's a goat. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a rascal. Oh, he's a good boy. Don't don't you no, ever come in here. Like, you... that's, what, that's what my wife always tries to say. She loves him because he's such an a-hole. Uh, I am not quite as uh, forgiving. I've nicknamed, he has many nicknames. Many of them are not repeatable. Um, <laughs> but my favorite is uh, is Spotted Dick. <laughs> he's, he's, got little, he's got little black spots and of course uh, I once threatened to bring my wife spotted dick back from the UK uh, and she of course. threatened to leave me if I did So, but I, I think that's a name that fits I like it 
Uh, so silly willy fourteen fourteen asks, any chance there will be more incentive added for trying to get to legend and top ten legend? A lot of people stop and don't care about it because there's no reason for them to get it anymore. Uh, maybe. I mean, I, I personally, I think we have um, uh, big, some bigger fish to fry. Not that that's not a problem, but. Um, you know, I'll go back to something that, that we talked about before, which is like um, we have any number of things that we want to do to make the guy the, the game easier or more accessible. Like yeah. I, we could do that, but I'd much rather focus on us like eventually getting to a thin client where you could download the game uh, onto a phone over cellular and not require Wi-Fi. Yeah. And you sense. guys don't yeah. care about that because you already got it on your phone, and so it doesn't matter. Right. But when I'm trying to acquire new players, and somebody sees our thing and tries to download it riding on the bus, and they can immediately get into the game, like, right? That's that's super important to me. Not not that that you know giving folks incentives to you know for playing at the legend rank also isn't. Uh, but it's it, you know you, you we can do anything. We just can't do everything. Something you gotta you gotta pick an order. Yeah, I think I said something similar on stream once where, um, you know, people were complaining, I think, at the time about how, you know, sometimes getting to Legend can feel pretty unsatisfactory. And I can understand that critique because, you know, you get three copies of your reward card at rank one, but you hit Legend and there's not even like a title or, yep. you know, and so like I can understand that feedback. But one of the things that I remember responding back um, at the time was that, you know, each season there might be somewhere between like one and 3,000 players that hit Legend roughly. I, I don't know the exact number, I just know from like ranks when I play against people. And, it, you know, we clearly, you know, on our end are not given full download numbers or anything like that by you guys, but it's pretty easy to go to like Google Play and see, hey, there's like half a million downloads and you can go to Steam and see there's all these downloads. And so, you know, my response at the time was, you know, if you put your business hat on, it, I'm sure that catering to those, like, you know, top 1% of players is really important, but I'm sure that it's also really important that uh, you guys cover the other, you know, 99% of the people that are probably not hitting that, and so, you know, be patient was kind of like my thing. But again, um, that I don't speak for you guys by any means, but that was kind of my assessment off the cuff. Yeah. But, it, you know, Trevor, it is something that we've talked about. I mean, um, and how we do that, I don't I don't know. And, you know, it's nice that Maricon is sitting in on this because maybe he's taking notes and that's something we can revisit. Again, like whether it's uh, special titles that you earn or, um, for lack of a better word, like bling on your profile to show, you know, how many times you've achieved different legend ranks or that you've reached number one you know what i mean like just yeah. different stuff that we might be able to do that give folks sort of that ongoing um recognition and status uh of like this is what my sort of resume and legends looks like um I, I think is something we'd like to 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 solve awesome and, and by the way somebody mentioned it and it's so far up in the chat, I can't find it anymore. But they were asking about like the UI as it relates to like stats and info. That and, was my next question. So we're almost caught up. All of that stuff, like yeah, absolutely. Um, it's one of the things actually. Solid Age uh, has been um, harping on. Uh, he's a big uh, uh, MOBA guy um, mm -hmm. and, and loves in in games like there's certain games that allow you to like. Like, I think you can, like, purchase a little stat tracker thing that you ap apply to a hero, and then you start to aggregate the stats on what that hero has done. Or, And so, like, I actually think it would be interesting to not only enhance and, and widen um, the stats and info on what you've accomplished, but at some point I think it would be cool to also be doing that on a card level, right? If you had a lightning bolt and you could actually mouse over it, and not only see what that card does, but you could see, like, how much damage you've done to creatures, how many creatures this has killed. You, you know what I mean? Like, just little stuff that kind of adds more depth uh, to, like, what you've done and the kind of things that you've accomplished. Almost like mini achievement trackers on a card level 
I think little stuff like that could potentially be uh, fun or interesting. But again, it, it goes on the list along with all of these other things that we want to try and, uh, and, and accomplish and do. And like, well, which one of those is more important? Like, well, we probably maybe need to focus a little bit more on the, on the question about player progression and, and recognition for achieving certain ranks and, and, uh, and certain tiers and stuff like that. So there's, uh, th- there's any number of things I think we need to, to look at. Awesome. Uh, just a lazy gamer has a follow-up question for the treasure hunt ability with treasure map wants to know if it still works, no. if it's already been active and the answer is no. no. Yeah. So, so, uh, a creature is considered to be hunting for treasure when that treasure hunt has not been completed because treasure hunt is a one-time thing it doesn't it doesn't keep doing it or repeating it so once it's accomplishment accomplished it it's no longer hunting for that treasure so you can't you can't do that once it's been activated it, it it's done it's found the thing i agree i like it that way it feels more flavorful, and I think that sort of stuff's important. I mean, like, that stuff matters to me when I'm playing. Yeah, I mean, if you find a really awesome treasure, you're just going to retire, right? Like, Yeah. You yeah. are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the dad jokes. Try the, try the veal. Uh, <laughs> tip your waiter. Mr. Uh, Mr. Teapot asks Pete specifically if you still keep in touch with the Warhammer 40k team. From like 15 I have years to be ago. confused with somebody else. I I never worked on Warhammer 40k. Yeah, it. I didn't remember that either, but I wasn't you, so. I, that that may have been Mike the liar again. Might have been Mike. Yeah, he. That damn he, cat. Yeah, well, we got into a thing, and then he started like running around and causing trouble for me, and that, uh, that might have been one of his. Yeah. He, he's the cat your girl tells you not to worry about. Uh, that guy, <laughs> I tell you. He, <laughs> Um, this is one that Pete might be able to answer. Uh, specifically, are there any plans to release the app for Elder Scrolls Legends in more countries? I know that there's some like issues with certain stores, but uh, yes, I mean there's uh, I, honestly, it, um, I, I I don't like if you ask if you put a gun to my head and ask me to name five countries where it's not available. I don't know if I could. I think most of them tend to be in Asia. There might be some others where we're not, uh, but I'm not always in the loop on the on the reasons why we are or aren't in um, in a particular country. In some cases, it's it's uh, well, it's political. Uh, you know, we're we're not supposed to put a game out in some country that's undergoing sanctions by our government or whatever. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I don't know if I could give you an, a, them an answer that would matter other than, you know, we we're trying to get it out absolutely everywhere to absolutely everyone. It, you know, that's the goal. Pete, what's your favorite modern deck in Magic? Uh, I don't play modern. That's fair. No, I, I played standard for a while. Um, uh, I did just, I made it to the top four of the PPTQ in a uh, limited PPTQ like two or three weeks ago. I was very proud of myself because I, I played really well with a really mediocre pool, but I, I identified the right deck to play and uh, made the top eight and won my first round in the draft. And then uh, I drafted a vampire deck and just lost to a slightly better, faster vampire deck. But I run all the, I run all the limited magic leagues at Bethesda, so all the field leagues and draft leagues. And then also I make sure everybody's playing Legends. And I actually stop by people's desks. Like I'll be walking through the sales area and there'll be somebody sitting there, you know, like drafting a deck in Solo Arena. And I'll like stop and talk to her about what she's doing. And uh, it's a it's a great way, honestly. I One of the things I love about card games is, uh, like I said, I'm not particularly smart. And I like having something that basically makes me stop thinking about everything else for a while and just focus on that and i find that games like legends and magic do that for me um and to and to charmer's earlier point i'm a huge collector nerd you know when i was a kid i collected sports cards basketball cards and soccer and football and and so um you know 
guys like uh, LSV, who's you know one of the greatest Magic players of all time. He probably owns like four or five hundred Magic cards. I own like thirty thousand or something. My wife actually built over there, over there, built cabinets in our kitchen for me to store uh, all my Magic cards because she was getting annoyed that they were there were boxes everywhere. But like, I don't want to trade them or sell them. Like, it's fun for me to sort them and keep track of them and. Yeah, yeah. It's their I I uh, legitimately my my best friend has a room in his house that he calls the vault, and it is a room entirely dedicated to his magic collection. Uh, he owns enough that he actually has like a rider on his house insurance. Um, he plays yep. like there's a couple of different sites that basically treat like magic cards like stocks and he's constantly trading on them. Mm -hmm. Um, basically if you want to play in a magic tournament, like you go to him, you sign a waiver and you can build whatever deck you want and take it with you. And then you got to bring it back. And he's kind of like our, our resource pool for events. Yep. I actually, the, the only standard event I ever won in magic, I won playing an Abzan aggro deck back when like Anna Fanza and siege rhino and, Den Protector, and the guy that I beat in the finals actually rented his deck from somebody like that, where he had just gone to a site and said, well, I don't want to buy all these cards. Let me just borrow them to play uh, play in an event. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> um, let's see. I saw a good question I missed. Oh, uh, do you play Commander at all? Uh, some. Yeah, I own a bunch of Commander decks. I've built one. We play every. Uh, there's usually a commander game down in the in the kitchen at least once a week. Uh, a lot of the QA folks. Um, mm-hmm. But lately, you know, we just launched Doom Switch today. I still have one, two, three, three, four. How many? Four more games to launch in the next couple of weeks. So it, it's just been, and, and like we're doing nonstop planning for E3 next year and like all this other stuff, like come six, seven o'clock, I just don't have the energy to like hang out in the kitchen for a two hour game of Commander. I'd rather come home and like veg, yeah. watch my basketball team lose. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about the loss. Um, that actually is a great segue into something that I wanted to ask you about. Um, what is it like to essentially like be not just the face of like Bethesda, but just of so many different titles. And I guess what I mean by that is, is when I think about other large gaming companies, they oftentimes have somebody who's almost like the face of a specific game. So like when you think of Blizzard, there's like Jeff Kaplan for Overwatch, but there's Ben Brode for Hearthstone and everybody has their own thing. But in Bethesda's case, you're kind of like it for a lot of titles. And so like, how do you balance that? And what, what's that like? Um, well, like for, uh, I tend to be more of like the generalist. So like when we do, like, I don't go on most of our press tours. Like if there's a press tour and they're taking, you know, Wolfenstein around for folks to play earlier this year, like I, I don't go on those. They send somebody from machine games or they, you know, for the evil within, they send somebody from, from tango or whatever. I, I tend to be the guy that folks come to like, well, it's at E3 or it's QuakeCon because I can talk across a lot of stuff. Um, And honestly, like, I mean, it's, it's that way only because like, well, I was the only person doing any of those things for five or six years. And so I just like, my approach has always different, been different because uh, like I couldn't rely on devs when we did press tours for those first five or six years. Like I did it all. I learned the games. I gave the demos or I helped people play because I didn't have devs that I could use. And so I sort of come from that, which is, you know, I want to play and understand and know the stuff that we're making so that I know what's fun about it so that I can give feedback on or ask questions about things that I think might be an issue or be confusing or, or whatever. Um, and as a result, you know, for the most part, I can talk about a lot of stuff. Like I can talk about VR, but the truth of the matter is I barely play VR stuff because it makes me too motion sick. 
Um, you know, some first-person games still make me pretty motion sick. Um, VR definitely does. But I can play enough of it to know how it works, what it does, why it's cool, things that you can do. Um, you know, a game like Quake Champions, I I can only speak to as a spectator because it's so fast. I can't sit down and play it for more than 90 seconds before I start feeling, I start feeling nauseous. Um, but it's just like... Part of the reason that, like, I love Bethesda and, um, you know, is like I get to be um, intimately involved as much as I can with all the stuff that we're doing because, well, that's what I that's what I like. I don't want to be distanced from it. Um, I, I like getting in there and understanding why they're fun and mixing it up. I've always I mean, felt that, like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just said, does that make sense? Like, does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, I, I've always felt that like it was more important to see other people enjoying an experience than it was to see people who are specialists in an experience. You know what I mean? Like as far as like sharing that enjoyment with them goes. Um, you know, like I know that I'm not like the greatest Legends player by a long shot, but I think that part of what I personally like to bring to it is like, hey, I'm having a good time. I'm I'm having fun, and we're doing this together. And I think that yeah. online gaming in in particular, the, and just computer gaming in general provides a lot of people who maybe didn't have like a whole lot of uh great community experiences growing up an opportunity to be part of a team when, and when the objective is all the same and it's working together in harmony and i think that uh i think that in that respect like uh you're the, you're the perfect person to be kind of the poster for this sort of thing because i remember the first time i saw you um I, i'm not gonna lie like i had no idea who you were until i started playing legends uh i uh i saw you uh doing a stream and you're talking about how much you love fighters guild recruit and i was like this is a guy who loves this game and so i was in you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh that passion i think in, in all things but in gaming in particular i think is really important yeah and i mean that's the the whole reason i stream is clearly i'm not trying to really like my goal is not to help anybody improve in playing the game i mean you guys know that right they, they can come watch you guys they they, they can find a lot smarter people who are way more competitive and into it and way better deck builders. Um, I'm going to come at it from my standpoint, which is, like, I do it for fun. Um, of course I like to win. Of course I'm going to make mistakes. I will lightning bolt my face. Um, I'll do it twice in one stream. You don't know me. You don't know what I'm capable of. Um, <laughs> but, but at the same time, like, I, I, I think that me coming at it from the standpoint of, like, I play Wolfenstein and I play, you know, Call of Duty and I play Uncharted and I play Legends. Like I'm, you know, I'm a generalist. I am not uh, just like a, you know, a strategy card only person. Which you know, I know some folks, uh, some folks are. But um, I think Legends is a really fun game that you can enjoy, even if you don't play it every day. And I think well that's said. important for folks to know. Yeah, well said. All right, let's uh, let's get like rapid fire, you know, very short answer questions. Anything you want to ask? Anything random or ridiculous? Um, yes or no questions preferred, not necessary. Things that can be answered quickly. What do you got, guys? Uh, Zami Hunter nine by nineteen said uh, he thought Brink was ahead of the curve um, and wanted to know if there was going to be like another installment of that. He really enjoyed it. Hmm, uh, I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> Fair. Or another break. Well, while we wait for the uh, questions to come in, I will say I also agree that I think Pete is perfect for just like showing the enjoyment of a game. I remember the right after the first time I got to talk with Pete, um, I was talking with Justin, and I said, "All I can say about Pete is, is I just want to play D and D with him. Like he just seems like that kind of guy that you could play tabletop games with and have a blast and." One day, Charmer, we will do that. We will we will pluck you out of the Mitten State, and we will get uh, Justin out of the Colorado and gather somewhere for some D and D. Yeah, that'd be sweet. That what, sounds awesome. What's uh What's a show that Justin and I should plan on meeting up at? Do you think we should plan for like E three? Um, like if you had to pick a show for us to say like, hey, let's try to make it. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get you guys to E three. Now, of course, E three is not a great place for us to like hang out and do D&D because &D, I am batshit crazy for oh, a yeah. week. Uh, but 
E3 would be really cool I, and would love to get you guys out there to, to, to see what's going on. Um, you, you know what? I, I don't even I have a question for you guys. I've been answering questions all night. I have a question for you guys, which is how much do either of you play of of stuff that's not card games, whether it's ours or Gwent, Hearthstone, Magic? Like, do you guys play like kind of rank and file stuff? Are there certain kind of games that you like to play or do you play anything else? Yeah, I, I, speaking for myself, absolutely. Um, I play Civilization VI quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I play Heroes of the Storm for the MOBA action. And um, lately I've been playing the Retro Sonic game <laughs> on, uh, on PlayStation. That's what I've been doing lately. Yeah, um, for me, I, uh, I just love games in general. Like, if you, if you name a genre, I've probably at least tried something in it. Maybe not like every game, but... Uh, I love tabletop games. If I were to pan my camera to the left, it's literally just a cabinet full of them, and I got people that I play with regularly. Um, so, like, board games, card games that are also tabletop-oriented, role-playing games. Um, I love, like, first-person story-based uh, games for, like, PC and console, so anything from, like, Witcher games to The Last of Us. Um, mm -hmm. I do also, like... I like to play Overwatch, but not like competitively because I have horrible mm -hmm. aim. So like I like to just kind of mind-numbingly play Winston and zap everything in front of me for a bit. Um, and I actually love mobile games. So when I'm not playing Legends, there's uh, a couple of mobile games that I, I jam out to. Um, Final Fantasy Brave Exvius is like an RPG gotcha game. And then there's another mm -hmm. one Goomy's got coming out. Uh, here in like three days it's gonna hit global release but i've been playing it early so i i i'll play anything if you put it in front of me well I, i'll 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 tell you guys what which is the ultimate answer to justin's question is that we need to get you guys to archon because if you've never been to QuakeCon, it is awesome like get you guys into byoc we'll create a little like legends row and we'll get some of the other guys out there and you know like let you guys sort of experience that we have a tabletop village at uh quakecon where we do magic tournaments and there's all i mean there's board game tournaments and people just playing for fun um i mean you get to enjoy dallas texas in august which if you've never experienced that particular combination of heat and humidity is not something <laughs> to be missed um so you know, I, I would I would love to to figure out a way to actually do something um, like that, and not necessarily because like oh we're gonna have some big legends announcement and you should be there, like because you know QuakeCon is just a celebration of all things gaming. If you love games and you love to play games, um, it's a great place to go. We use it as a way to show off you know titles that we're working on on our let folks play it, but it's also just sort of three or four days of like having fun i've taken my kids there a couple of years i mean um they neither of them could come this year because one was starting college and one was starting high school but um it's going to be earlier in august again uh this year and uh honestly i'd love to talk to you guys about you know getting any number of uh legends folks down there for a little uh, get together and honestly just hang out and have fun and enjoy games yeah i mean it sounds sounds great it sounds like uh like uh what is it gen con um yeah i mean it, it's it's a bit like that except there's the five thousand person byoc and yeah yeah, you yeah. Know, there's, there's all this other stuff going on but like a few years ago i put my foot down and i was like we're doing a tabletop village like we're gonna play board games and card games and um and uh, it's gone really well, and it's continued to, to grow, and hopefully we'll, maybe we figure out a way to get you guys down there in 2018. I'm definitely down. That'd be exciting. Um, okay, so we asked for rapid-fire questions. Here we go. Pete, Nora or Nate? I don't know what that means. I don't either, man. I was really hoping you did. <laughs> Ray Ray Barker asks, what is the meaning of life to you? <laughs> 42. Great answer. Uh, Coral Papa asks, can we just ban all aggro decks? No. Can you say if there, just a lazy gamer asks, can you say if there is a zero cost card in this expansion? I don't actually remember and I have no way of looking up. Hey, Maricon, make a note that we have to figure out how to fix it so that I can play production builds 
from home because I was going to play Tesla for <laughs> Blackboard City tonight and then realize that either BNet or, or something else is locking me out of playing from home probably because my IP isn't waitlisted. But I, I honestly don't remember whether or not there's any more zero costs. Um, Kaniac asks about more cosmetic changes to the game board. We already talked about that. The answer is they're on their way. Yeah, I mean, everything, right? Anything that you look at, we are contemplating changing or fixing. Message, how we pop up in-game messages and information, where, how the menu looks, what the playmat looks like, what the card frames look like, uh, everything. It's all up for grabs. Okay, that hits a couple of these. Mastodon asks, where is Starfield? I don't know. That's fair. Sounds like uh, in space. Uh, yeah. Jelly filled or sprinkled donuts? Mm, I think I'd have to go jelly there. I'm not. I a totally agree. Guy. I'm gonna go with glazed. I yeah, I mean, I'd rather have a good glaze, like a, or a chocolate iced. But if it's choosing between those two, uh, I'd definitely awesome. go jelly. Um, any plan? Any plans for an in-game clock so that we don't uh, stay up till 4 a.m. by accident? Uh, Todd, you know, Todd Howard mentioned that to me as well. He's like, okay, you got the, you got the uh, battery indicator on there now. That's the first step. Now I need to know uh, what time it is. So we'll, we'll work on it. Cool. It, we're like the casino. We don't want you to know what time yeah. it is. We want you to <laughs> <laughs> Number one thing I take to a casino is not money, but my watch. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't gamble anymore because I know how that ends. <laughs> uh, Zombie Hunter 9 by 19 says change in the audio for College of Winterhold. I would also like to request that it be louder because unlike other people, I love it. Okay, Maricon, take a note. They want the College of Winterhold sound louder. <laughs> Shunara asks about fire and frost runes in the past. Are there plans on tweaking runes? Uh, that was something we had discussed in a couple episodes where. We talked about how it would be cool if you could change like what your next rune to be broken to like a frost rune, where instead of drawing a card and triggering a prophecy, like it it froze something or something like that. There you go, Maricon. Add that to your list of possible features. Yep. <laughs> and Dumpster wants to know if they decrease the volume of skeevers. Please increase the volume of skeevers. Uh. Okay. <laughs> I don't see that card a whole lot except in in arena. Yeah, it's crazy good in Arena. Uh, Rock on, man. Okay, cool. I think we have a good list for Maricon to go away and work on. Yeah. I bet he's really glad he showed up. Yeah, I bet he's so happy with us right now. <laughs> we'll <laughs> we'll never... To work and showed up to a two-hour podcast where we made a giant list of things for him to do. Don't <laughs> nothing make it so, sir. Yeah, we'll never get him on now after this. Jeez. Nope. Uh, almost all of which, I, and, I mean... All respect due to everybody who commented. Almost all of those ideas were awful. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll end on this one because I think this is actually a pretty great question uh, from Corky the Great. Uh, Pete, he asks, Triss or Yennefer in Witcher 3? That is a really good question. And I, I think the answer is... I think the answer is Yennefer, but honestly, I'm really conflicted. I yeah. really like them both. Yeah, I was going to say... for. For me, it's why not boast that gif, right? Like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I felt really bad when I uh, when I slept with the dryad witch lady in her wacky little world that she takes you to. Yeah. Was that in the main game or the expansion? I don't um, remember. Well, there's... Uh, what, no, like... that was the main game. Yeah, there's like as, Kira... As soon as, I was, yeah, as soon as I came out, I ran into like one of them and i was like oh crap i just slept with that chick and now like that probably wasn't good i probably still smell um but yeah i think it's yen but sandra, honestly, uh, but, yeah sandra the lady of the lake good no i'm done i was gonna say sandra was watching me play that game one day and um i was running around the main city with the whorehouse and she's like justin you should hire a prostitute I was like, uh, okay. So I hired a prostitute, did the thing, and then she looks at me and she's like, why did you do that? And I was like, oh my, oh my god. So <laughs> I, I failed the test. My my wife is always like the other end of the spectrum. Like, I'll do it once to see the cutscene and then I'm good. And then I remember we were playing Dragon Age Inquisition once and I came downstairs and she was, 
she had watched the sex scene like three times in a row and I was like, honey, is there something I need to know about? And she was like, no. Word. Yeah, she was like, no, I just I just thought it was fun. And I was like, okay. Actually, the one place I did that in The Witcher is, uh, was it, oh, shit, now I'm forgetting because it was two years ago. Who was, okay, if you haven't finished, I see people posting spoiler, like, guys, it's the end of 17. Witcher 3 <laughs> came out two and a half years ago. If you're still trying to avoid spoilers, like, get off of Twitch entirely. So just stop listening what I'm about to say. So, you know, towards the end, you one of them you get into a thing within the tower and you say the wrong thing to her and she blasts you out the tower window, like, into the moat. Oh, uh... That, was that Triss or Yennefer that does that? And I was like, wait, I was trying to be cool and, like, not get in trouble, and she blasted me out the window. So I reloaded the save to see, like, <laughs> what happens if I... Like, what was I supposed to say? I don't know, man. I, I think that might have been Yennefer. Yeah, I feel like that yeah. was Yennefer, because that doesn't yeah. seem like a very Triss thing to do. No. I don't remember what you're talking about. I think that's Yennefer. I think so, too. Cool. Yeah. Well, I want to say, Pete, it's been an absolute honor talking to you. I mean, like, you made one of the favorite, my favorite games of all time. I know you didn't make it, but you're part of the process, and you're the face of the thing. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you as a guest tonight. It's been fun, guys. Thanks for having me on. My, my wife uh, it just safely landed in Missouri, and so I've had two hours to shoot this shit on a Friday night, which I don't usually uh, have. So this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this was fantastic. Any uh, closing thoughts for uh, for our audience? You can you can just make fun of them if you want. <laughs> no, thank thank you guys for honestly for tuning in and and thank you for also supporting folks like uh, Charmer and and Justin who I think do a do a great job of not only um, being good stewards for our game and our community but are also wildly entertaining. So, um, <laughs> and uh, you know I, I'm really excited about the new content coming up and. And getting these guys to to get their hands on the game and uh, and stream some of it for you to to let you see what's coming up. So hopefully that won't be too much longer. We're getting pretty close. You know, fantastic. He says we're he says we're entertaining until he sees our male enhancement commercial for next week. I, I, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm That's positive true. that will be entertaining. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we have made the for the for the audience. We've made our commercials a regular thing. We're gonna have something coming up next week that uh, you should get a good laugh out of. <laughs> yeah, sure, we all will. We always do. <laughs> awesome, possum. Well, thank you guys very much for having me on, and thanks to everybody else for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Awesome. Peace out. Take care. Have a good night, guys. Night. You too.